In today's webinar, I want to examine three key questions. First, how do we connect that project, that action, to the social studies content, knowledge, and skills? It's really important. And then, how do we engage students and connect to their experience? And then, how do we set up students for success and, and a really important thing, assess their work? So right now, I'm going to stop my share and, and introduce Lakeithia White. Uh, let's welcome her. She began her teaching career as a Teach for America Corps member in Brooklyn. She went on to become a teacher leadership coach for the New York City Department of Education. It's now an implementation coach at Inquire Ed. Hey, Lakeithia, it's so great to have you join me today. Hi, Martin. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and I'm going to go back to my um, screen share really quickly because I, I want to dig in with you into that idea of connecting the project and action that students do to the learning that they've done in the unit. One of the ways that you all do this when you work with teachers is, is you really work with them in one lesson to synthesize their student findings and draw conclusions. And it's really like a dedicated landmark lesson that um, students work on where they reflect and they collaborate and generate ideas. Talk to me a little bit about the importance of that pivot, that shift when uh, teachers and students get to that point of view. Okay, so I first wanna say that I believe the pivot happens even before. Um, the lesson and that it, 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 exists, it exists in the belief and the mindset of the teacher, right? And so the teacher really um, believing that real world connection is powerful and makes learning more engaging and content more memorable. And also if a teacher has commitment to increase in their own practice and they want to better understand the impact that taking action can have on student learning or engagement, it's really to me where it starts even prior to, to this lesson. But once we get into that synthesizing findings and drawing conclusion lessons, we really have an opportunity for students to reflect on their learning that they've engaged in throughout the inquiry to really draw conclusions. And they can collaborate to generate ideas about challenges and opportunities that they might address as a class um, prior to preparing to take informed action. And, and within the curriculum, we also um, provide opportunities for teachers to use discussion product protocols to really facilitate and structure these conversations and these learning moments with students. Yeah, that's uh, one of the things that I know that is important in, in inquiry classes um, uh, all over is that there, there are artifacts of learning that are sort of like collected and uh, displayed around the room in, a, in, a, in inquiry classes. And, and I don't know if um, the teachers out there and the participants and our participants if you have your kind of favorite way that you display uh, make learning visible in your room, if you want to share that in the chat, that would be great. But how can the artifacts of learning that, uh, that are collected over the course of a unit help teachers at this moment as well? Hmm. Good question. So by the time that teachers and students are ready to make that transition to action, they've been through a sustained investigation. And so over that time, um, teachers could be collecting and adding to and students adding to anchor charts or they can also create together a unit long display. And so having these anchor charts, vocabulary walls, unit long displays really help students to reflect on their key learning. But also, I think that artifacts provide an opportunity for celebration, right? And it can also help students to really just see how far they've come within the unit. And then I think artifacts can really help highlight the beauty of the inquiry process, that it's ongoing. There's almost always more to add to it. We can always revisit it. We can always adjust it with our learning over time. Yeah, and I want to say that as a, as a high school social studies teacher, I, I use those artifacts of learning on my walls as well. Um, that we see, we see it maybe as, a, as, a, as an elementary, more elementary thing, but what it, what it did for me and my, my ninth graders when I taught world history is one, the information was always available to them. It wasn't getting lost in a notebook or whatever. It was on the walls. And it began to, they began to take ownership of what those, those things looked like. And it also became 
they would go there to get information and then do something with it. It wasn't about remembering the information, it was about what are you gonna do with it, you know? Yeah. Um, you mentioned protocols uh, yeah. that teachers sometimes use, discussion protocols, and, and I, want to, um, I want to ask about that. Um, what kind of, um, what are strategies for discussion and reflection? And I'm actually going to share something with our participants that they can go to and take a look of a, a big collection of these mm -hmm. um, that we put together. And I'm going to share everybody in a link in the chat. Um, what is a what is a great strategy for discussion and reflection that you use or, or that you can use at this moment to, to synthesize and conclude? So sure. So one of the things that we know teachers are often looking to do is save time. And so within this guide that Martin just shared, one of the uh, protocols that I like to use is a whip around because it provides each student with a chance to quickly share their thinking or reflection with an entire class in only a few sentences, right? So this is not something that's super labor intensive or materials intensive. A teacher can simply pose a question to the class and give them you know, some time to, to jot or draw or think about their answers. And then just in a quick whip around, each student can be invited to share their response. And so it doesn't require, like I said, a lot of prep work or time. It can even be done, I think, in a line on the way to the restroom or coming up the stairs from recess. Like, it's quick. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and everyone, check out that, what we call the field guide. What is in there is um, a whole bunch of different strategies. Some of them are really appropriate for this moment. One that I love is conversations, where you have uh, each small group has a discussion question, and then they discuss that, and then you have two members of each group, they're in groups of four, switch, and then go to another group and, and start that discussion all over. Um, check out those protocols. There's some resources in there to help you as well. Hey, Lakeithia, right now, uh, I'm going to stop my share again because I would really like to invite uh, our two panelists, our two other panelists, um, to turn on their cameras. We today are going to be joined by Rhonda Jackson. She is a K-5 master teacher. There she is at Thurkle Elementary Middle School in Detroit Public Schools, where she teaches second grade. And then Jacqueline Scher, Jackie, it is an instructional coach and bilingual education teacher at CCSD 21. Welcome Rhonda and Jackie. It's great to have you here today. Hi everybody, it's great and, to be here. And so um, Rhonda, I'm gonna start with you. Um, and we had a conversation uh, last week and we said that it's, it can be hard for teachers, especially when it comes to taking action and creating projects, to, to follow student uh, interest, to uh, engage with their experience, encourage them to lead their own learning. Can you talk to me a bit about how you've seen your students develop as you kind of have made that shift? Sure. Um... As noted, I teach second graders. So when we first uh, started the inquiry journeys process, um, as a teacher, we like to control everything. So I started, I, I got to control it. I have to control it. And what happened, I said, I'll start backwards. I wanted my kids to see the end during the beginning. So this is what we're working towards. So as they saw, when they saw the end, they became more involved, more engaged in, in the process. They, they, they began to ask questions. So now we have what we call a question parking lot in our classroom. So whenever they have questions, they just write them down. They put them on the parking lot. And we pick, we pick the question each day. So what? When we started, it wasn't that easy. We, I had to kind of train them a little bit. So I would start asking questions and like probing questions. And then for me, because I, I asked the probing questions, they began to have discussions amongst themselves in groups. And that's how we began our question process. We first started with the question formulation video. So I watched it, but I also let my students watch the video as well. 
So that kind of helped. generated so. those questions and that kind of lit the fire and they, they, they started to express their interests. One of the things that you, you, they led you to and you arrived at together was this idea of examining um, urban gardens. Yes. And um, I, I'm curious about how you, um, how you got to urban gardens. You were studying like natural landscape, kind of geography, and you arrived at, 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 at really talking about researching urban gardens. Tell me how you got there. Well, we were working on needs and wants. And the kids, we at Thurkle, we have a garden in our front at the front of the school. So when you come down the front, we have like five plant boxes. So the kids were talking about the foods that they eat. And we started talking about our certain foods needs or our certain foods wants. And one of my students said, well, we eat the things that we want because we can't get the things that we actually need. It's hard for us to get healthy food sometimes, the fruits, the vegetables. So I took my students outside and we looked at our garden. It was in the winter time, so it wasn't a lot of plants out, but the kids could see where some plants were starting to sprout. So I asked the kids, how many of you have a grocery store that you could walk to? How many of you have a grocery store that you can drive maybe five or 10 minutes to? And then some of the kids were like, we don't have grocery stores. We have, one, one little boy said, I have a garden in my backyard and my community has an urban garden. So uh, they, he has a garden in his backyard, but his family also goes to the urban garden in their community. And what it is, the kids started talking about, yeah, we, I've seen those in my neighborhood. And I think, that, and then they started saying, it's a big need for having healthy food, especially in a pandemic, because they were like, we don't want to get sick, so we can't keep eating chicken McNuggets and french fries every other day. <laughs> or we can't keep eating pizza on every Friday and Saturday. So they started bringing their parents into the conversation because we were virtual. Um, our superintendent had the wisdom. He saw the numbers ticking up and he was like, we're gonna go remote. So I said, how can we change this? And that, that's when we created the survey. And the parents were like, I didn't even realize that in my neighborhood, I didn't have a grocery store because I'm always shopping at a big box store like Target or Walmart. And I said, this is why we have to go to like city council meetings and different meetings in our community to let them know, hey, we need a place where our families that don't have transportation can go to get healthy food. Because the urban garden is not always up in the wintertime. We can only get that food at a certain time of the year. I so love that that what you did was listen to listen to the kids and mm -hmm. and follow follow their interest and, and everyone this is the what you see on your screen is the survey that that Rhonda sent home and you said that te that the parents were filling it out with their with their kids and they were mm -hmm. making a lot of different realizations um, mm -hmm. and that's I think it's just a really great example of connecting to their interests yeah. and their experiences their communities yeah um, I want to ask uh, Jackie, uh, one of the ways that we um, we try to connect and engage students is developing what we call an inquiry challenge statement. And it defines the action that they're going to take. It's co-created with teachers, co-created with their students. It's kind of like a mission statement. What is a, I know that you, as an instructional coach, are working with teachers and and sometimes co-teaching. What have you found? What is an inquiry challenge statement? What have you found that it does for a class of students? Why is it important? Well, well, you know, like you like you mentioned, the inquiry challenge statement. It's really 
what sets the purpose for the kids to start digging deeper and digging further and taking, um, you know, we were talking about this action. It, it allows them to define how they're pursuing their passion. And it kind of ensures that the project that they're taking is authentic to them. It, it feels authentic to the audience that they're choosing, the, the challenge and the goal that they are going to pursue. And um, it ensures that they're going to create a product that is feasible for them. Uh, and, and the process of creating the inquiry challenge statement really leads to that um, the, the, that expectation of this is what we're doing, this is how we're going to do it, here's our audience, um, here's our goal, and this is what we hope to get out of it. So um, this is an example of how we led a group of second graders also. Uh, this was in the Our Changing Landscape unit, but this process kind of, um, we worked through and we chunked or uh, took each one of these questions and we just answered each question and then we were kind of put it into that sentence frame of the inquiry challenge statement. So I believe on Inquire Ed, there is a similar organizer. We just kind of color coded it for some of our, uh, to support some of our learners in different ways. Um, so you can see how we, um, we actually started with the goal, right? What is our goal? and how do we want to impact others? And then we worked backwards. Well, who, who is this really going to impact? And what steps can we take to make that impact that we can actually do? Because, you know, some of the kids have these really big ideas. And Martin, you were talking about, you know, action doesn't need to be an earth shattering, policy changing action. And action could be something that really makes an imprint on your school and your school's community. And so kind of giving them the lens of how can you make it important for you. Lakeithia, I want to bring you in there too. Do you feel like, what do you think is something that gets in the way of teachers taking that action, taking that step um, often? I mean, it could be like, it has to be so big, or I mean, what, what is it that come, sometimes gets in the way? I think it's a lot of different reasons. Sometimes I think it's what Rhonda named in the beginning, like wanting to control things. Um, I think sometimes it's an issue of time and resources. So if you have the, the belief that it has to be this huge project, then you're um, thinking that you have to have more access to things like, oh, I need you know materials that I don't have or something like that. Um, I think sometimes it's just really a mindset shift for teachers in terms of like what the role of education is, what the role of social studies is. Um, if I believe that students should have an impact, then I'm more likely to do this. Um, but sometimes just, you know, our traditional ways of, of experiencing learning ourselves can get in the way of what we do in our classrooms. Yeah. And um, kind of to think off of that, I think in planning, um, a lot of times teachers really want the plan from beginning to end, and there is a little bit of discomfort in not knowing exactly what the students, where the students are going to take it, and surrendering that um, that need to know exactly where it's going to go really leads to more robust learning and experiences for the kids, but it is that um, you know, knowing that there will be a point when you're planning that you won't have all the answers and that's okay. Mm -hmm. I have to agree with both Lakeithia and um, Jacqueline. It's the planning process. You know, we as educators, we want to plan every little step. And this process I had to really examine how I plan my lesson because I'm like, I cannot plan. It might not, I might want them to do this one question and it might go in a whole, in a whole different direction because of what they're in, my students are interested in. And that's the one thing I like about the inquiries process. 
my students are interested, my students are engaged, and therefore I can pull back and let them teach and take ownership of their learning. So that doesn't happen every time in planning. That sometimes those moments just boop, they just pop up. They just pop up. I think that's the that's the that's the magic of, of the inquiry process, but it take, does take some trust. But it also takes a lot of like work to get them you to get them to sort of get to that point where or where they can lead their own learning. One of the things, uh, Jackie, that you did really interesting with, in an interesting way was this idea of an inquiry challenge statement is probably really to second graders. Obviously, it's like, wow, well, I don't understand what this is. And what you did was you you took a look at some of the books that maybe you were reading as part of the unit. Um, and you made up inquiry challenge statements for the characters and the um, the stories in that you were reading, which I think was a really like really uh, interesting idea. Can you talk a little bit about where that idea came from and how it went over with the kids? Sure, absolutely. Um, I think just you know we. Um, our district is currently realigning our standards and. Thanks, thank you, um, Our district is currently realigning the standards, and so um, we felt the, um, the ability to kind of take some of the units that were, or some of the modules that were in Inquire Ed and the lessons within those modules, and um, look at them, Martin, as you said, through um, the lens of the Inquiry Action Statement we felt that this process of using our literacy or our literature as case studies, um, talking about what the kids did and uh, having the language to talk through the action challenge and, and the, um, the process that the kids took in the books, they've understood it in the, the context of literature and then they can, begin to internalize that of that's something I can do. I've seen the kids um, who save the sea turtles in their community. I saw the boy who was able to uh, create a, um, a generator with wind. And these are real stories and they really happened. I understood it through the kid language of the trade book. And now I can do that for whatever I'm thinking to do in my own life. That's right. And you know, I, I had the realization the other day, I was helping my 14 year old daughter with her thesis statement for a three paragraph essay. And I said, and she said, what is it like? It's like a mission statement. And then that's made me think, you know, this is, these are core literacy skills that we're really working with second graders on that are going to stay with them and help them later on, because this is really about a statement that is clear, that has a goal, that, you know, has an audience purpose. So it, it was a, it was a realization for me. You came up with, uh, your problem and your action statement, Jackie, was, uh, that there was trash on the grounds at Riley school. Um, right. And then, um, tell me a little bit about the final action statement that you created. Yeah. So, um, the kids kind of took the concept of the unit. Um, again, as I was saying, our, District standards are currently realigning, so um, it wasn't directly aligned to kind of the real goals of the Art Changing Landscape Unit, but still similar. Um, the students decided that they would make posters and presentations so they could educate and inform the people in our school community, hoping to reduce the amount of trash. And we came, we had a ton of different ideas about how to do this, we thought we could do a trash measuring challenge and um, go out in the community to clean things up. But we really settled on something that the teachers felt comfortable doing and the students uh, in the short amount of time that we had were able to access. Uh, after this, we had, um, or due to this, we had students getting on the announcements, the morning announcements every day they wrote and then presented their announcements over the intercom. 
we had a, two groups of students create a very short video podcast type presentation that we sent out on our YouTube channel. Uh, we had posters up all over the school and we had some kids speaking at uh, in each lunch period about informing their peers about how to reduce the amount of trash in our school community. So again, you know, we've been talking about there are amazing ways to do really big community projects, but the community to which our students most relate and will see themselves is our school community. So these were the uh, ways that we saw this inquiry challenge statement manifest. Hey, Rhonda, one of the things that we could say is that, you know, creating these projects are all fine and good, but how do you, how do you assess them? How do you, how do you develop success criteria, all of these things? And, and I know you, you worked with your students to kind of develop these, a rubric, a success criteria, and you did it in a, like, uh, uh, kind of a sneaky way because you did it throughout the whole unit. Can you tell me a little bit about what you did to get your students to a place where they would know if they had successfully created these posters that you chose posters as well? Can you talk a little bit about that process for you? It was sneaky. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, what I did, I went on YouTube and I picked PSAs, public service announcements. And I asked the kids, and I would, I would try to find like one that was done really well and some that were kind of, one that was kind of mediocre. And I would have them compare, what, I would have them compare them. What made this PSA stand out? What did you like about this PSA? Did you like the color? Well, you know, was it bright? Did you understand the message of the PSA? And then I would go on Google and find images, like different images of posters. What do you think about when you see this poster? Does this poster make you want to, because I did pick toothbrush, teeth brush. Does this poster make you want to brush your teeth? Does this poster make you want to brush your teeth? So. We, what we did, we talked about the creativity of the, we had a rubric for creativity. We had a rubric for uh, language and literacy, like are the words capital, are words capitalized, are proper nouns capitalized. Um, the creativity part was like, can I, how can I bring people in to want, make them want to plant an urban garden or participate in an urban garden. So the kids created the, and they were really nice posters, very nice posters. Um, because what I did, I talked to my art teacher at the school and I said, I really want you in on this project with my class. So that was the first step because my kids like to draw. But what we did, we took different types of texture paper, materials and they made like 3D shapes of fruit, 3D shapes of trees, 3D shapes of vegetables and said, and one uh, title was, I want to stay healthy for the rest of my life. Here's why we need an urban garden. And I, and I, and some of, I was telling Mr. Andrews, I was like, I cried when I saw some of them because I was like, oh my goodness. I said, my kids were actually they were thinking and due to the fact that we had to go remote my parents missed like the displays of the poster so i took a picture and we made a powerpoint so the parents could see the work that our students that their students had done and the parents were like this is awesome but they came up with all the rubric i had nothing to do with it they were like it has to have so many colors it has to have when we write our words, they have we have to make sure that the first word is capitalized. We have to make sure that people understand why we want this, why we need this. Lakeithia, when you work with people, teachers, and they're creating, the, they're co-creating that rubric, 
it's it's probably something that I mean many of them might not have done before. What is it? What is the what's the what does it do for a classroom to to co-create that rubric? Um, what does it do for the students? Well, one I think co-creating a rubric establishes a more equitable classroom environment, in, in, in my opinion. And the reason for that is that it eliminates surprises. We're all clear on what the expectations are, and these expectations were driven by the students, right? I also think it's an opportunity to really facilitate um, peer feedback and self-assessment, right? If we have clearly created uh, criteria, we have a grounding point in which we can look back at our work and engage in conversations with one another. I also think it increases like motivation and engagement for all learners because they have a sense of autonomy, right? They have a sense that they have been a part of, of creating something together. Um, and I think you're right, Martin, that there is there are a lot of teachers who have not yet experienced this and it, it, it can seem very challenging, but I also just want to call like to attention to the fact that many of our, you know, um, assessment practices that we have for teachers, like our, our evaluation systems also ask for, for these types of things to happen. Also with the UDL framework, right? There should be opportunities for students to co-create um, and co-construct criteria. So it's not just like inquire ed or just this informed action project. These are effective practices, right? That, have, that are research-based. And I also just wanna name that like, teachers have been very creative when it comes to um, this process and bringing in models, right? Like we've heard from a teacher on Twitter that um, one of the inquiry products that her students were going to make was, uh, they were making game boards to um, educate uh, the population about our nation's changing landscape, right? And so in order for them to, to compare models and get this criteria, she just held a game day in her classroom where kids were playing board games, right? And then figuring out like what, what are the components of a board game that makes it interesting, engaging that, you know, like these are things that, that students are motivated by and interested in, right? Yeah, it, when I, I remember the projects I created when I was in when I was in school and I would get a grade back and I didn't know why I didn't know why I got this grade and it, that 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 idea of not having surprise and, and then you feel like you don't have control over that as a as a, as a student you know um, Jackie I know you worked a lot with creating uh, looking at models with with your with the students that you work with and teachers you work with. And these pictures up here are of student work that you looked at, um, that you found. Can you talk a little bit about your process? And I think we have your rubric on the next page too that we'll, we'll look at. Absolutely. So when we, um, for this particular example, when we went to go, um, after we started to have one or two days of product creation, we pulled back and we brought all the students together and we found online, similar to what Rhonda was saying, we found online just some examples, positive examples, and also we did find some not so good examples of um, projects that were within the range of the types of products that our students had also selected. And so, uh, we had the kids look at the products and talk amongst themselves in groups about what they thought was good in a in one of these posters. Or uh, we watched posters, we watched a few YouTube videos, and um, we gave them the option of listening. I believe it was listening to a podcast, but I don't know if any kids took that. So. Um, and we actually just started in the column of my best work. So we said, what would your best work look like? And a lot of the kids say, oh, we know exactly what the poster is trying to tell us. So that was our clear message. And we, we took that and we said, well, how do you know? You know, we just kept asking those, how do you know? Why do you think that? And the students got to, um, just two basic qualities. The message is clear and the images or the visuals are, are powerful. And um, so we talked a little bit about, again, the, my best work. Well, what would it look like to have a clear message? 
Um, looking at, again, we looked at those case studies with the boy who harnessed the wind and um, there was like a farmer one and something else. So we looked at the case studies. What did these people do? Look at these examples. What are they doing? And um, the students themselves came up with the idea that their inquiry challenge or their product should let people know that they should be doing something. There's a problem and um, it should call their attention. And they, they kind of created these qualifiers of the my best work and then we worked our way backwards into good work and okay work what is that what happens after so I, i'm stopping the share now and I, we're going to take some questions here in a second but um so you we've set you up we set students up for success in, in a couple ways we, we we connected to their learning you created this sort of mission statement and then you have them co-create the rubric, and then by magic the, the project gets created. So what's the for 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 you, Rhonda, and for you, Jackie? What are the next steps in this process? When how does how does this rubric get used? Mm -hmm. um, how do, how do we how do we have students go through a process of creating uh, a product? instead of just having a, a one-off, I'm done, I don't have to work very hard on this. What's the process after this? Um, what I believe um, we sh my next steps will be with my next project, if, if I do a poster, hang the po posters up and have and do like a gallery walk and give my kids the rubric and have them check off. Mm the different boxes like she said the clear message is there a clear message does it catch my attention do i understand what's happening what is this poster saying to to me am i receiving the message would my family understand this post so just having the kids critique each other but in the critique we, we i'm learning that we have to teach them to be not so harsh in the critique because all it takes for sometimes is for one person to like be really harsh and it'll shut it it'll shut a student down so what i do is i build an environment where mistakes will be made and it's okay and i always tell my kids that's why pencils have erasers <laughs> So when they're going through that process of using the rubric, they understand I'm not trying to be mean. I just want, I want to be, I'm critiquing it and I'm leaving it at that. Yeah, there's definitely a, that aspect. Again, we're talking all about ownership and having the students take ownership and that self-assessment really is part of the process. I believe there is the lesson on critique. There's partner critique and um, there's definitely that independent piece or if they're working in a group that to, to really take ownership to increase the quality of work and you know Rhonda I was thinking about what you were saying having students critique and um, for something like that they can um, they can always have you know like two post-its a, a yellow and a green post-it the green post-it they write something good the yellow post-it one thing you want to change you know, they can pull the language right from the rubric if they don't quite know how to give a constructive feedback or a constructive um, critique that doesn't hurt too bad. You know, they can just pull that language that they've already generated from thinking about a quality product. Right. And what I like is that we're already doing that in our language arts piece. So it's almost like you're crossing the bridge the cross curricular so they're bringing a lot of those skills from ela into this so that is just is just a different subject area yeah and that skill the skill transfer into the content area is what what's making them really internalize it right and they decide you know if a teacher is teaching with maybe a worksheet in language arts but they're able to again authentically you were talking about 
making the kids knew their posters needed capital letters and their posters needed periods and um, having the authentic outlet for them to transfer their skills is I think what's you know what's really going to impact learning the most that opportunity too that you're talking about to create a draft and then maybe get feedback on it from from their classmates that's something that I don't I don't ever remember doing in my education until I got to, got to my MFA program and I wasn't very good at it because I'd never practiced it getting that kind of direct feedback and Lakeithia you're just kind of nodding your head what's the what's the ways that you can it's a Rhonda pointed out it can be a, a dangerous thing to just throw kids in and say give feedback on on this mm -hmm. work because because they don't know how just like adults many of adults don't know how what's the what's the sort of like baby steps that we can take to begin that process of learning how to give feedback to another person so I think these ladies will probably have much better ideas than I do, but one of the things that I think is important for us to remember and stay grounded in as educators is that we can't have higher expectations for our students than we do ourselves. And so a lot of what students learn from are the models that we set in the classroom space. So if I want my students to be able to give kind, specific, productive feedback, I need to be able to give kind, productive, specific feedback on their work as well as I need to be able to elicit feedback from my students about my work and be able to accept it and pivot and learn from it as well. So to me, it's, it's all like reciprocal energy in a, in, a, in a classroom. Like what I want students to do, I have to be able to do. And that, that, that just flows through everything, I think, in a classroom. Yeah. And we had a question about sentence stems. Is that, is that helpful? Oh yeah, I think sentence stems definitely help. I think graphic organizers can help. But I also think that you have to teach into certain things like nonverbal communication as well, or tone of voice when you're giving feedback, right? All of these things matter um, when kids are giving and receiving feedback. So it's, you know, the sentence frames are one thing that's a great start and I think you can continue to build upon that. Um, I think kids can also have like very explicit um, conversations about how does feedback make me feel in my body? How does it make me feel in my breath, right? Like these are things that we can we can call their attention to and have to think about as well. What was the what was the response? Um, this was a question that came up. What was the response of your students at the end of this process? They're ready to do another one. <laughs> <laughs> um, they're actually ready to do another um, action uh, project and I really think because they it was their work they were proud of their work and that excitement they're they're like okay when is the next one what are we gonna do for the next one and I'm like uh, they were like no book we don't want to do another book because they already said they don't want to do another poster I was like okay so I'm like do we want to so we're looking at the different ones. And I said, we want to try a flip grid. That way we can send it home to the parents. The parents can watch the video and, um, and the district can watch the videos. And they were like, oh, I like the flip grid. So this, this one we're planning on doing a flip grid because um, we're working on the change in that landscape. And I was sharing with uh, Mr. Andrews, how one of my students um, was talking about, we were talking about changing landscape, and he brought up um, the war over in Ukraine and Russia. And he was saying people had to leave and migrate. I was migrate, we didn't talk about migration. But he brought up migration. He brought up, he even brought up like cultural changes. What's going to happen to the children, they're used to one culture and they're gonna leave what they know because not because they want to, because they have to, what's gonna to happen to that their culture when they move from one place to another. So I was like, oh, okay. 
So now I have, a, I know I have a student that watches the news. <laughs> so, but they're excited. So I think we're going to do Flipgrid on this one with the changing landscape. Jackie, what about your, what about the kids there? Um, oh, yeah, I mean, they're barely satiated upon completion of a unit. There's, if you guys have kids, there's this saying that sleep begets sleep. So like the more your baby sleeps, the more he or she will want to sleep. And um, I think inquiry begets inquiry. Mm -hmm. Like yes. the more that the kids do it and they engage in it and the more um, the more ownership they have of it, the more that they, they just need more. They need to be satisfied by something else. They need to be satiated by something else. Mm -hmm. That's great. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, run out of time, believe it or not. So we didn't get to take a lot of questions from um, from our uh, chat, but we have lots of comments there. Uh, Allison says, love that. How does feedback feel in my body? How does feedback feel in my breath? Resiliency. And then the students have become experts. They had the opportunity to share their expertise. It's thrilling. So of course, they immediately ask, what is our next inquiry? That's, um, I think that's really, really what we want. We want these students seeing that their learning has a purpose in the world. And, uh, and that's, what's, that's, what hap that's what's happening in, in your classrooms. And that's super exciting. Um, thank you so much for being here today and sharing, uh, sharing your expertise with us. You get one, Rhonda, you get one, and, and Jackie, you get one. Uh, what's one thing that you would say, Rhonda, to a teacher who, who is, uh, is worried about taking that first step in the inquiry? What's the advice that you would give? Practice makes progress. <laughs> we always say practice makes perfect. Per practice makes perfect. Practice makes progress. Yeah, and right. we have to get out of that mindset of perfection. Each unit will get better and better. And you will see the growth of your students, and you'll even see the growth of yourself as an educator. Jackie? Um, trust in your students. They know, you know, they know really valuable things. And, um, you know, we talked about that, um, that, that give and take with feedback, that everything is, that learning is a, is a conversation. And um, the best conversations happen with those with whom you have strong relationships mm -hmm. and those relationships foundations is trust. Trust that they're going to take it, uh, take the projects and take the learning in whatever direction it needs to go. Um, and they can do it. They can do it. All right. Thanks. Thank you so much for being here, Jackie and Rhonda and Lakeithia. I hope you guys have a great, great evening. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thank you.